So when I was in college, uh, a few of my friends went out to grab lunch when we were studying at the, the library, and they asked me, uh, Trent, do you want to go get lunch with me? And I was in the middle of an assignment, and I was a good student, and I wasn't going to go to lunch. I was going to be responsible, so I decided I'm not going to go, I'm going to stay and study. And so they went to, to lunch out at a restaurant, and they came back about an hour later, and they had this giddiness about them. And I'm like, well, what happened at, at lunch? I said, you'd never guess who we got to meet. Now you gotta understand, I went to, to university in Nashville, so seeing celebrities and musicians was kind of a common thing around the city, and so I was like, well, who'd you meet? And they're like, well, we saw that one kind of fringe new country singer with that hit single on the radio, Teardrops on My Guitar. We met Taylor Swift, it was awesome. We got, we got a picture with her. I was like, are you kidding me? The one time I stay at the library and choose not to study, and I, I remember I said, prove it. Prove, prove that you really met this, this what we thought was one hit wonder person. She's a little bit more famous now. And they pulled out their state-of-the-art flip phone with an inch screen that was really blurry, and they said, see, there's us, and there's her, and I saw, and I guess it was missing from the photo. It was me, the guy who chose to stay at the library, the guy who chose to study, and I know it happened, right? But there was still something inside of me that made it hard to believe. I wanted proof. It's kind of a funny story, but I think it's a real question that you may wrestle with, especially on Easter Sunday. Have you ever found that you had your doubts about something because you weren't there to see it happen? I mean, we get together at Easter to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And I think for, for some of us that maybe makes sense in concept, right? Well, okay, I get that Jesus died on Friday and then people said he resurrected on Sunday. But let me just ask you a question, because what we all have in common is we weren't there to see it, right? None of us were there to actually see it. So do you believe it actually happened? And do you believe what it actually means then for our lives if it did happen? I think it's a, an important question for our lives. I think it's an important question to talk about on Easter Sunday. Did the resurrection actually happen? I think a lot of us are here because you do believe in the resurrection. We want to celebrate that Jesus rose again from the grave, and that's amazing. But isn't it also true, even for followers of Jesus, even for myself, we can still believe in the resurrection and then have seasons or moments where we face doubt. We can believe in the resurrection and then have these moments where it's like, is Jesus really like listening to my prayers? Because he seems so silent in my life right now. I believe in the resurrection, but is God actually working in my life because I can't see him doing anything right in front of me? How do you, how do you see Jesus? Really the question I want to talk about this morning is the one that Easter raises every single year that we talk about it, is what do you do with the genuine doubts that we have? And how does Easter actually give us assurance about the things that we do believe in life? So I want to give an encouraging word this morning. I've given the title to Seeing Jesus. Because seeing Jesus is the whole premise of Easter. You had the disciples who were devastated on Friday. It was silent on Saturday. And then Sunday morning, they began to talk and to shout, we've seen him. He wasn't in the tomb. And the disciples ran back from the tomb and said, he's gone. We met some angels. The angels told us he resurrected from the dead. And then Mary Magdalene, she raises her hand. She's like, I got one better. I saw Jesus in the garden. It was funny. I thought he was the gardener. It was actually Jesus. Like, I hugged him. I touched him. He's real. He really rose from the dead. And then there was one disciple on Easter who didn't get to see Jesus. He didn't get to be a part of that whole experience. And his name was Thomas. You ever heard of Thomas? Thomas has a funny nickname. It's Doubting Thomas. But I want to go on record this morning to say, I think Thomas maybe has the wrong nickname. I would like to call him Relatable Thomas this morning because I think you're going to find that he has a lot in common with you. He has a lot in common with me as well. And I want to tell you a little bit of his story that we zoom in on in John chapter 20. And here's how it starts. It says, on the evening of the first day of the week, that's Sunday night. Okay, so Sunday night when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Jesus showed up and stood among them. 
and said, peace be with you. How would you react if, if that just happened? After he said this, he showed him his hands, where there would have been wounds. He showed him his side, which would have had this huge wound from a spear. And his disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I mean, can you imagine? I know we're 2,000 years removed, but just imagine yourself in that room. Easter morning happened. The word is spreading. Easter night happens. The doors are locked. You're afraid of everything going around, that the people who killed Jesus are going to come after you next. And boom, in, in appears Jesus, where you're having your, what would be like an Easter supper tonight. Jesus is just standing there in the flesh. And he proves it to them. He's like, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a paid actor. Like, it's really me. I really have wounds on my hands. Another disciple says he ate a bit of fish. He's like, he's got a, he's got a body. It's like Jesus is in the room. I mean, I've met a lot of people. I've even had thought myself of like, if Jesus was standing right in front of me and I could like touch him, I would never have another doubt in my life. I would, I would never have another disbelief. I would just, I would follow Jesus all of the days of my life. If I could just see him. Have you ever thought that? I've met a lot of people who thought that. That's a guy named Thomas. It continues and it says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Thomas, buddy, you like just missed him. Where was he? He was like, he was like right here. They're all in the same room again. It's like Jesus was standing right there. What was he doing? He showed us his wounds. Like, was he real? Was he a ghost? No, no, he, 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 he's on fish. Like, Jesus was really in this room with us. And Thomas, Thomas wasn't there. Now, we don't get any other details about what Thomas was doing. I mean, maybe he was just sad and he was devastated from Friday. And he said, I'm not, I'm just not going to the Sunday night church gathering. I'm too sad. Maybe he was doing something important. Maybe he was running an errand. Maybe he was taking care of someone. I don't know, maybe he was a responsible student and he stayed at the library to study when everybody else went to go do something else, but he didn't get to see Jesus. And everybody's like, no, 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 Thomas, we saw him. He's here, he's here, he's here. And here's where Thomas, I think it's really relatable. Listen to what he says next. He says, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not Believe. Thomas faced doubts. Now, I want to be as gracious as I can with Thomas. For one, I'm going to meet him in heaven someday, and he's going to ask me about this message. But I also want to be gracious because every other time we see Thomas in the Gospels, he is one of the most courageous disciples. There's a time when Jesus is going to raise Lazarus, but he stays behind to make sure Lazarus is really dead because he's going to do this huge sign and miracle. But Jesus would have to go to a pretty dangerous part of town to do it. People were out to try to trap Jesus and get him killed. And Thomas is the one who raises his hand and says, Jesus, if you're going to die, I'm going with you. Let's all go to the grave with Jesus. He's courageous. Thomas and the rest of the Gospels. And yet Thomas, a disciple of Jesus, Walked with him, talked with him, ate meals with him for years. He faced doubts. And isn't it just a little bit encouraging, I know it does for me, that a disciple of Jesus can face doubts. And that doubt is actually a normal part on the journey of faith to seeing Jesus and believing in him. Why do we doubt? Why do I have doubts? Why do we have doubts in, in life? I think there are several reasons, but let me give you a few of the biggest ones. I think we doubt because we have questions, good questions, that we don't know the answer to. I mean, I've asked some of these in my life, like, I don't know if, if the Bible is reliable or true, because this testifies to Jesus, but if this is not true, then how do I know if that's true? We have questions about evil and pain and suffering and why does this exist in the world? Those are good. Those are good questions that we should wrestle to the ground. Oftentimes we face doubts because we face difficult situations. You know, you can have a theological answer for everything in your life, but there's still some questions that don't really sit right in your heart. Where you know, I know why pain and suffering exists, but why, God, did it happen to me? I know God doesn't make mistakes. I know he's sovereign, but why did he show up to all of my friends on Sunday night, but he left me out and he left me with all of these doubts? I think sometimes we doubt because we do get clear answers, but we don't want to receive them into our life. 
because that would change our life. That means I would have to obey Jesus and God. And I don't know if I really want to accept that in my life, so I'll kind of just place my doubts upon God. We all face doubts. I've faced doubts as pastor. People at this church have faced doubts. Even if you're new or you're guest this morning on Easter, you have faced doubts. Maybe you're even here facing doubts. And there's always two things that you can do with your doubts. The first is you can do what Thomas did. And Thomas set up a condition with his doubt. Notice what he said. He said, unless this happens, I won't believe. We can do that in our faith. We say, well, God, unless you answer my prayer the way I want you to answer it, I won't believe in you. Unless you answer this question the way I think is right, I won't believe in you. Unless you show up and do a miracle in my life the way I want it done, I won't believe in you. And we can set up these conditions with our doubt, can't we? That, that's one thing we can do. I will, I will stay here. Thomas is like, unless I touch your wounds and stick my hand into your side. Gross, right? Who wants their wounds touched? It's kind of weird. It's like, that's my condition of faith. Or, instead of a condition, where you can seek God in the middle of your doubt. What I want you to see from Thomas is that your doubt doesn't have to define you. God can actually use your doubts to develop you and to strengthen your faith. God uses doubts to develop us. Your legitimate questions do not have to push you away from God. Your doubts can actually bring you to God. This is part of my own story. I, I faced a lot of doubts as a teenager. I looked at the Bible, I looked at the world around me, and I said, I, I have a lot of questions. I don't know the answers to. And I've been taught a lot of things in church, but how do I know those are true? And then I was facing a lot of situations. But I chose to take my doubts and have them lead me to Jesus and to the same things that Thomas had access to. I looked at the eyewitness accounts. I looked into the Gospels. I looked at the passage that we're reading this morning. An interesting thing I found is the Gospels aren't just like religious traditions. They aren't just a bunch of like church people stuff. It's not just a bunch of a bunch of prayers. The Gospels are eyewitness accounts from people who walked with Jesus. I mean, it's so unique. They, they wrote about the things he did and the things he said. They even included some pretty embarrassing details, like this whole story about Thomas. They're making it up. They probably don't include all the embarrassing details, like, oh, yeah, there's one disciple, and he just he was filled with faith, and then filled with doubt. No, they actually included the real truth in the Bible. And I found it was historically reliable. I mean, maybe like hundreds of years ago, you could have had more of a challenge at this, but even in this modern scholarship, non-Christian, even atheist scholars would say the Bible is really good historical evidence. And I thought to myself, how much of history do I believe because I saw it? How much history do you believe because you saw it? Like pretty close to zero percent, right? We go off the faithful and reliable evidence that we have before us. And that's what the disciples are writing in the Gospels. Here's my point. You can see Jesus based on people who saw Jesus. You can see. You can believe. You can take their testimony as legitimate in the Bible. And I love that they gathered that night. And Thomas, I know he was in a rough spot. He had real doubts, and he was honest about them. But I love what happens next. Check this out. It continues on. And it says, a week later. That means the next Sunday night, when they gathered basically for church meeting again, and who was with them? Thomas. Thomas showed up. That's what faith looks like when you're doubting. You just keep showing up. And if you're in a miracle city, you gotta know, you don't, have every, you don't have to have everything put together to come to this church. You don't have to have all your beliefs set. You, you don't have to like put down all of your questions and just believe. No, you come with your doubts, you come with your skepticism, you come with your legitimate object, objections, and you can come join. You come to the series next week when we're talking about the gospel. I love this. This is Thomas. He shows up at church. He's filled with doubts, but he's still there. And if you're at Easter this morning and you've got doubts, can I just say, we're glad you're here. We're really glad you're part of this church. We're really glad you're part of this church. And then look at this, this what happens. It says, though the doors were locked, Jesus came. He did it again. And he stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And I imagine more than the shock 
of Jesus standing in front of him in the flesh was what Jesus said. Because Thomas didn't tell that to Jesus. Thomas just told his friends. Thomas didn't tell Jesus that he had to touch his wounds and stick his hand in his side. He only told his friends. And Thomas was probably thinking, wait a second, you heard me? Like I was praying and I was doubting and you still, you still heard me. And I thought you completely left me. And I thought you had abandoned me and left me out. But you, you never left my side. You were there the whole time. Even when I let my doubts define me, Jesus, you didn't define me by my doubts. Here's what I want you to see, especially if you struggle to believe. If you're doubting God, if it's hard to feel Him, God is present in your doubts. When it feels like God has abandoned you, God has not abandoned you. When it feels like God is not answering your prayer, God is still in heaven. Jesus is still interceding for you. When it feels like all is lost, God can never lose you. God is always present. And Jesus doesn't want to leave us in our doubts. Which is so important. It's so encouraging that God, even though we face doubts, he says, I don't want to leave you there. I want to give you assurance. Thomas, you may be doubting, but I want you to be certain and I want you to be sure about something. And Thomas, doubting Thomas, says this next. He responds, my Lord and my God. Theologians call it the highest proclamation of faith in the entire New Testament. Came from doubting Thomas. Where he says, my God, you really are God. Jesus, you defeated death. That means you created the universe. That means you created me. That means you know me. That means you really are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then he takes it one step further and he says, my Lord. And Lord means I actually give you control of my life. I don't just recognize that you're God. I'm actually choosing to recognize that I'm yours. You are Lord, and I give my life to you. See, because you can come to Easter, we can have Easter, and you can believe in the resurrection, and that's good. But you can also never make Jesus the Lord of your life. A lot of people, I think, believe in the resurrection, but they never take the next step and actually trust their life to the one who was resurrected, to the one who is alive. And that's what Thomas does. He says, my God and my Lord, and in a second, come on, I want you to see this morning, in a second, he went from doubter to believer. I'm not discounting your questions, I'm not discounting the process, but I am saying, look at how quick it can happen, from doubter to believer, and in one second, doubting Thomas turns into believing Thomas, making a great confession of faith. And I think this is so cool, look at what Jesus says next. It's like he's, he's speaking it into Miracle City this morning, because he, he writes this in, and it's, it's way forward looking. Jesus says this, because you have seen me, you have believed. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who are those who haven't seen? That's us. That's us this morning. That's believers all over the world that are gathering at Easter. That's us. We have not seen, but blessing on those who haven't seen, but yet they have believed. You say, Pastor, what is it? How, how can you believe? How can you believe when you haven't seen? It's just so hard for me to grasp. You have to see what Thomas saw. You say, what did Thomas see? When Jesus stood before Thomas and he extended out his hands and said, Thomas, look at my wounds. Thomas saw the wounds of his crucified friend, his crucified leader, his crucified savior. And I think it's interesting that Thomas never touches the wounds, does he? Thomas never touches. Thomas says, oh, I'm never going to believe unless I touch. But Jesus shows up and Thomas says, whoa, 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 I've seen enough. I don't have to touch your wounds because I realize, Jesus, what those wounds mean. Because the wounds on Sunday meant that the wounds on Friday were real. It meant that Jesus really did take sin to the cross. It means it really does give forgiveness and freedom to those who believe. And Thomas didn't need to touch the wounds when he realized the reality of what the resurrection meant. See, we gather today, we come to Easter, not because we believe that we're reaching out to God. That's religion. Religion is what can I do to get good with God? God, can can I impress you with my good works? Can I give enough money? Can I do enough stuff to have a relationship back with you that my sin broke? 
No, Easter in Christianity in Jesus is about a God who came to you and reaches out to us. And his wounds are extended towards us. And Jesus would say, look at the wounds. Look at the wounds. You want to know how Easter helps us in our doubts? It's because the one thing we want, the one thing we need, the one thing that you go searching far and wide for is the thing with Jesus you never have to doubt. It's that God loves you. That God loves you so much he'd send his son to die for you. That he would take those wounds for you and for me, not because he was trying to rub it in our face, but because he actually loves us. In your past, God loves you. With the decisions you've made, God loves you. With all the times you've doubted, God loves you. In all of your unbelief, God loves you. In all the conditions that you've placed on God, God loves you unconditionally, and Easter proves it. An empty tomb proves that God loves us. And in the times when you doubt it, in the times when you're saying, Pastor, it's just so hard for me to see, Jesus is even willing to come the week after Easter, to people like Thomas who are struggling and really get rid of unbelief in him. Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Thomas, by the way, who from church history would tell us that he went on to preach the gospel in India. And he wouldn't stop because of not what he had heard, because of what he saw. He would stop preaching a message to other people saying, you can see Jesus through my testimony, through what I saw, from who he is, from the wounds that were extended to me, or the same wounds that are extended to you, until finally he wouldn't stop preaching, so people ran him through with a spear in his side, and he wouldn't stop because of what he saw. That's not doubting Thomas. That's courage. That's confidence. That's exactly what God wants to give us on Easter. You can believe. You can see. You can see him through the eyewitness accounts. You can see Jesus through, through all he's done for you. Look, if your life is a bunch of random coincidences or there is a God behind the scenes who has been working every step of the way to bring you to him and to bring you into forgiveness and freedom and redemption, you can see Jesus through his wounds. You can see the love of Jesus extended out to you. You can have faith. You can believe. Empty tomb proves it. You can see Jesus.